Another customer repair on the bench. This forms a trilogy. Uh, the owner of this uh, Philips D8534 Compo Sound Machine, as they call it, also owns two of the Hitachis that I've previously repaired on this channel. Uh, this is a recent acquisition of his and um, the reason it's the trilogy is that uh, he was making an effort to get back all the boomboxes that he had uh, when he was a teenager and uh, this is his most recent and it does have the speakers that go with it, they're just behind me for the moment and um, he used this for one day, uh, worked fine until it didn't because two of the buttons, the record and stop button at the bottom have got jammed and uh, these use what Philips call the servo tape transport which I think is basically just not too dissimilar to that Sanyo boombox that I fixed for my friend in Berlin um, I think it's probably driven by the uh, flywheel uh, and the capstan motor and uh, these uh, Philips decks made in Austria uh, and similar decks that use basically the same transport are well known for a fault uh, with the plastic gears. They're unaffectionately known in some circles online as the cheese gears because they crumble basically. Now they're not doing bad at their age, this is from 1984 uh, so it's coming up for 40 years old and fortunately uh, because it's quite a well-known fault uh, on these decks uh, there are people that mould uh, or machine new um, replacement gears so I think this might be an issue in this one. I've been asked to give this to works. Um, I'm not going to cover too much of the cleaning and stuff in this one uh, because I've already done that. I, I am at a slight time constraint. And I don't need to make this video really long with shots of me running a cotton bud around it. I can do most of that off camera. The reason I want to do this is, uh, apart from showing the owner is I want to focus on uh, the tape deck on this and a couple of other little things I will come to. Um, these were made in Austria, as I mentioned. Uh, I've found evidence looking inside the speakers that the plastics were done by BASF, uh, who weren't just a cassette company, as many people think they were. They were actually um, a plastics company, they were a chemical company, so they did a lot of um, plastics moulding uh, and stuff like that uh, in Europe, as well as, of course, having factories in uh, America and all sorts of making. Uh, tape compounds and all sorts of things but they were a plastics company as well so I believe most of the moulding uh, was done by BASF so it does make me wonder who you point the finger to uh, for this uh, issue with the gears apparently it's caused by um, a grease that was used on the gears and it's kind of unusual to use greases on plastic gears usually if they're nylon they're self-lubricating but apparently there was a grease that was used on the gears and over time that grease has proved incompatible with the plastics that we used to make the gears and it softens them, it, it, it ruins the plasticizer in them and makes them crumble. Uh, so yeah, the cheese gears, I think that's going to be an issue that we're going to have to deal with with this one. The service manual is available, the service manual is also god awful. Um, unfortunately it just shows the actual tape mechanism just as a box. Um, goes into no detail at all about how the tape mechanism works or what the parts of it are. It shows one belt for the counter. <laughs> uh, so yeah, going to do um, a restoration on this, hopefully we can sort this stuck mechanism out. Um, it still ejects fine. The head block is down so it's not stuck up. It's not really stuck in any mode, it's just that the buttons are just jammed in. Um, something else I want to mention as well on the speakers. Now I'm hoping it comes across clearly on camera that the front grille of this at the top, they are plastic, um, has a kind of cloudy grey mottled finish to it and you can see a kind of unusual star shape there. This is supposed to be dark grey, it's supposed to be the same colour basically, although this is a painted finish, it's supposed to be the same base colour uh, as the faceplate here. Now over time, I've seen it on other pictures of them, it may be something to do with maybe a mould release agent or something that's used in the, the moulding of these, I'm not sure, but much like a car bumper, the old plastic car bumpers, um, the plastic goes all kind of cloudy. Uh, this kind of shape in the front of it makes me think that it's something to do with the moulding. Um, now as I said I'm not going to cover everything on camera here but I will cover a little bit of this. Let me show you the other speaker, because uh, the speakers are identical uh, between left and right. Let me show you the other one and explain what I've done. 
As Amy Winehouse said, I go back to black and that's exactly what I used. Um, these do come apart, uh, there's two screws at the bottom and then basically the back of the cabinet just kind of hinges out. They're very simply made, uh, this is a very plasticky unit in fairness. It's probably not one that someone would kind of actively seek out these days for a, a really nice quality unit unless they've got some nostalgic connection to it, which is the case here. Um, but yes, the cabinets still come apart, the driver isn't fixed into the front, it's kind of held in by a sort of metal spring. I'll try and show a little bit of this later on. Uh, the, um, the front grille uh, does come out. I didn't take this one off, I just did it with um, a cotton board soaked in um, bumper restorer basically, kind of back to black, but um, just an old Wilco uh, knockoff, RIP Wilco. Um, and then I did actually remove this grill, washed it, cleaned it with a toothbrush because there was some gunk in the top. Uh, treated it again with a cotton bud soaked in some uh, bumper restorer stuff and then just give it a final spray. Um, the lights are washing it out a little bit actually, the contrast, I've got the big video lights on here. But um, it does look much, much better and it's a much better match for the uh, face plate of the, the thing. So if anyone's got one of these and you've got the same problem because I've seen lots of them floating around with this kind of ugly white sort of stains all over the uh, the plastic on the, the grills then yeah back to black bumper stuff um, don't spray it directly on the speaker uh, you can take them apart otherwise soak a cotton bud in it and just go over it uh, with a cotton bud and you can get that colour back so we'll be doing that to this one as well for the final thing one detail I do like about these is that the uh, the speakers, are, as I mentioned earlier, are identical between left and right. There's a little bit more cleaning I've got to do there, I can see. Um, what I quite like is on the sides, they don't have like an ugly bracket or anything. They just have this uh, kind of vent shape here that's moulded in. But on the sides of the actual unit, uh, just sort of fit into the inverse moulding of that and then you've got the clips on the back that hold that on. I think that's quite a neat touch because I have seen some of these uh, detachable speak units before when they've got like an ugly fitting on the side and it just looks messy uh, when the speakers are removed and they're on a shelf or whatever it's just not not a very clean look. Again because these are identical left and right it doesn't matter which way round they go and um, they're symmetrical again when they're kind of sitting on the round so they look quite smart. And another detail I quite like on the top of this is that the handle's quite small but the handle at the top uh, actually clears the antenna. A lot of boom boxes if you've got the hand if you've got the antenna up sorry uh, you can't lift or retract the handle but on this one you can because it clears it there. I just think that's quite a nice little detail. Uh, quite convenient there. So yeah, I'm going to get into this, see if we can look at this tape transport first. Uh, if I can find out what's going on with that, I might have to order some gears. I've got a belt. We'll see what's going on. Alright, so on the back, I've got the battery compartment. It takes 8D cells. Uh, luckily, very clean in there. Interesting on the back it says, caution, use only carbon zinc or alkaline batteries at size D. Never seen anything that recommends using carbon zinc batteries before, they're awful. They probably last about five minutes. Um, yeah, on the back we've got an aux input, we've got an aux output, loudspeaker jacks which are on two pinned in connectors, and uh, RAF, that's probably a beat cut switch for if you're recording from uh, AM radio. That feels a bit <laughs> a bit rough, but uh, we'll never have any reason to use that, I don't think. Uh, we've got the mains input and a DC input, which says nine to 14 volts DC, so there must be a regulator. And then two external mic inputs with holes at the top in case you've got the old mics with the old remote start plug on there. Um, I don't know if it's got mics built in. don't think it has. I think the mics are probably only external. But yeah, no uh, battery leakage or anything. Those battery springs are enormous. They're like suspension springs. Um, doesn't look like there's any screws in there. So I'm actually going to pop that back on for the moment. Uh, 
and we've got two screws at the bottom screw there screw there that one's for the antenna we'll leave that one so it looks like there's just four screws in the corners and it should there's none underneath anywhere else remove the back okay the screws were very loose I knew someone's been in this before so the four screws and then we have a purple wire that looks like it goes to the antenna and doesn't look like it has a connector soldered in uh, that's kind of lousy <laughs> Really, just to there. Uh, we have a date on the motor of 27th of August 1984. That makes sense because the latest uh, molding mark I saw inside one of the speakers was, was November 1984. So this was probably done for the Christmas 1984 period. So this big plastic block here um, is all we see from the back of the tape transport. And we've got another 1984, uh, October 1984 moulding mark on the front panel. So we've got tuner board, amp and mixer board, and the front panel down there for the graphic EQ. Um, it's frustrating that that is just there like that. It just solders into the top of a switch okay there is enough slack on it to lay it down it's going to have to be kind of like that the entire time this big heat sink and shield here just has this transistor which is probably a power transistor it's probably a regulator or something like that it's not the amplifier because it's only a three pin uh, package um, that's a massive heat sink for that little thing I've forgotten what they call that size of package, it's not T0220, it's the one underneath. I'll put it up on the screen now, look it up properly. I think we need to take that off with these two screws down here. They're also really loose. Weird. Actually this maybe doesn't lift off in the way I thought it might. I think this actually removes all that board at the bottom if I take that screw out as well. And that one. And the motor. Hmm. I can see the flywheel belt tucked away there. There's a very thin black wire there tied up with these two red ones that I have to be wary of because that's easy to miss. There's a little clip here just to hold them in place. Oh, I see. There is a screw down there. Just where this holes here. One there, and this one I think. Again, not very tight. Ooh, that's quite a long screw. So that one's probably the same. Yes. Two identical long screws. One at the top there. There we go. Okay, it's partially loose. Apologies if that was massively underexposed. Um, the joys of black plastic things. See this tag here? This kind of goes under this white linkage here with the uh, copper spring on it. So be careful that that doesn't get caught on anything and snap off. Now, can we spin it around? What have we got connected there? We've got the motor wiring. 
Got a tie there. There's a tie wrap here on this wiring that would probably help if I undid that. I see, so on the bottom of the heat sink there is a chip, which is probably the amplifier chip, which is why that heat sink can't be re removed from the board, so now we tend to just have pull that straight off the board. Does it give us enough room to work with it? Can I pull these wires out of there? It's a red wire that is trapped in a little grip along the front face plate. That helps remove that. Uh, see the counter belt. That's uh, seen better days. Okay. Well, actually, a lot of it is <laughs> now coming apart. What I think I'll probably end up doing is desoldering some stuff here. I think I'm going to have to desolder the um, motor wiring, which is handy because I think I might have to apply some power to the motor just to see what's going on with the mechanism. What are those for? These red wires are from the head. Uh, I think the raise head and uh, record and replay head. So we can take that out sideways. That's better. Still not a couple there. We've got brown wire pair there that go to a leaf switch in this side. The blue wire that goes to a leaf switch at the bottom. And the yellow wiring I'll have to desolder straight off the motor. Then I think I can leave the head wires in position and flip this mechanism around without all that wiring being trapped like that. Maybe there is another um, cable tie there that will give me again a bit more freedom. I can just cut that. Yeah, that makes that a little bit easier. But that gives me a bit more. Yeah, I don't think I really have any choice but to do some desoldering here. So, see if we can get this in. The motor has the yellow wires and the black wire goes to the left, they're actually marked negative and positive on the motor itself. Let's see if I can remove these. Yep. So I'll make that a little bit easier. And then I think these we have on the blue pair we have uh, the white stripe in the centre of the four and the same on the brown pair, so the two um, wires with the white stripes go in the centre. The outer two are just the plain brown and blue. It does make life a lot easier. So that short screw is coming out. That matches those. That does make life a lot easier now. I have to be careful with this fine wire here, but at least now I can kind of handle this and get right around it. So, there's a flat screw down there. I'm just wondering if this back comes off, because it's loose there. And to get into the flywheel, this back I think would come off. But there's a, there's a big gear there fastened to that. I might have a, a look at this. <laughs> we'll think about how this comes apart. 
All right, bit of a lash up, but I have my power supply set to 9 volts connected to the motor. And I attempted to put it into play, I think. That's something definitely stand up there. Ah, we just cleared it. Aha! Don't know what I've done, <laughs> but I've cleared whatever that fault was. Maybe it was just binding against the case, I'm not sure, but by putting the power on that, that's going. I still want to do the belt and I still want to look at those gears. But that is running, isn't it? It's stopping because that isn't running. That's the auto stop. Okay. So whatever I've done there, I managed to clear the jam. That's good news. So just a note on that. Uh, I could access the motor wiring from uh, the deck without taking anything out. So if yours is stuck in a position like that, you could feasibly just unsolder those two motor wires without taking any of this out and put even a 9 volt battery um, onto the positive and negative of the motor and potentially operate it from the front and clear the fault. I wonder if it was kind of locked up uh, in a fault like that because if one of the leaf switches was open that powers the motor um, it won't respond to anything because there's no power going to the motor to turn the mechanism around. If you put power directly to the motor you've bypassed all the leaf switches so um, much like again when I did that um, Sanyo boombox and um, had to deal with a similar kind of mechanism I was powering the motor directly on that to test it and uh, it seems that running that a couple of times it did lock up at first but when I just kind of wiggled it around and did it um, back and forth it did clear its its jam and seems to be now functioning I still want to get in it because I th I think I'd like to do a new belt and I do want to have a look at those gears. One other thing I should mention is I can definitely feel and smell that kind of old grease um, all over my fingers from this so um, it maybe just wants a bit of a clean around the uh, mechanism around the buttons and everything as well because that may be causing a little bit of binding uh, against the case and that may have contributed to its, uh, its jam. So looking around this mechanism it looks like there's a slotted screw here. Don't ask me why it's a slotted screw. It's the only slotted screw in here. And that loosens the top. And it looks like I've got to remove all the push buttons from the front that should slide out by pressing on them from the, the back like that. I think there might be a bit of an order for getting those out. Yeah, so they have to come out in order because <laughs> they have little stoppers. So those come out, that's good because those can be washed and it seems there's then a spring on the pause mechanism there that we've got to, uh, if you can see that, that we've got to uh, sort out. I might have trouble focusing on that because I'm quite close to it. So we have to get this spring out of there. It's 
going, it's popping. There we go. All right, we're in. So it's just some pressed fit plastic parts, but they're just these little hooky clips here or something like that that just bind it together. I'm running out of space. <laughs> what I think we can do at this point is remove the capstan belt and I think the flywheel comes out, it does. I'm very careful. And those are our gears and you can see how discoloured they are. Quick fill in while dinner's cooking, it's the next day. Uh, I've been doing some research on these gears and I've found uh, a supplier in Poland uh, who does a full set of brand new manufactured gears. Um, there are some sellers, I know there's one in the UK and there's a few others I've seen that offer 3D printed gears. Um, I'm not sure of the quality and longevity of those and I think what the seller that I found is offering um, just looks a, a much better product and it wasn't really much more money. It actually comes as a full kit with uh, three gears, uh, two belts and some silicon grease. And one question I posed to them before I placed the order was how do I get these gears off because it looks like, if you look carefully, it looks like there's a little kind of mushroom shaped retainer over the top so um, I thought there might be some kind of clip to pull up there. It turns out there isn't. All you have to do is get something like a, a knife and very carefully pry underneath them and I've already done this one to loosen it and they come straight off. Uh, so the little kind of head there is actually the same the same diameter as the shaft so the new one should just push straight on. Now amazingly this one, um, this is one of the gears that's supposed to break and it's actually alright, it's actually quite tough. I'm still going to do them, I've still placed the order for the gear because there's no way they will last. Um, but yeah it just seems that um, you can very carefully, you have to hold down whatever's underneath but very carefully just get something underneath and just, just pry on them. Uh, and they should come off the little stem. Uh, this one might be a bit trickier, I've got to watch this as well. But I should be able to do it. Again, they're only on a little plastic armature underneath, so you, you do have to be careful, perhaps if I press down on it, uh, I might be able to get it off. Of course, if your gears are already just crumbled, well, you won't have this problem. Feel it going. That's it. You see, this is just a plastic armature. So it looks like the, they are greasy. It looks like the new ones when they come will replace these. Again, that, because it's a different colour, it might be a different plastic. This might be alright, but again, I'm not going to take any chances. Three gears come in the set, so if they all fit okay, I'm going to replace them all because we only want to do this once. So I'm temporarily just going to put those back on there for now, I'm not going to push them down because uh, the parts are going to come from Poland and uh, when everything arrives we'll tackle this cam gear and then do all three and clean it up and do the uh, fresh grease as well. Alright, we're into the new year. Christmas has come and gone uh, and all that time I had to wait for the gears for this Philips machine to come from Poland and a uh, set of belts as well. So uh, in this rather fetching pink we've got these polyurethane moulded uh, gears, um, some uh, silicon grease and yeah a set of uh, two belts. So um, the tricky one is going to be this one underneath because we know Previously I'd already removed these two and I'd just popped them back on just to keep them in place. They're already loose, um, so that's straightforward enough. Let's just pop them back so I remember where they go. Um, but this one involves removing this cam gear. Uh, not only do I have to remember to keep that in place, um, but there's three tiny little, uh, little bits there that you have to bend backwards to release the gear to get this one out. They're also, as I probably mentioned earlier, all kind of greasy uh, so that's all going to have to be cleaned up um, and then I'll do the uh, the new grease, the silicon grease. I think I might have to remove that gear. 
bit to shuffle that sideways a bit and the end of that spring I can get something to point the end of this spring needs to go into it's just come out there this little piece underneath and it, there's kind of a black it's almost like a track that it rides in and you have to make sure it's the other side of that as well you can see this being <laughs> a bit of a nightmare so try and get that back in a second so, so have to make sure that stays down there now does this piece lift out I'm going to say no it doesn't it's fixed to something on the other side so we might just have to lift it aside like that it's okay that I can lift one of the little bits back but I've got to lift at least two Not that the hole is pointing this way towards the bottom, towards the buttons basically. Got it. Got it. Oh, look at that, where I've been prying, the gear's cracked. <laughs> the cheese gear. Yeah. It's probably the worst one. Um, you might not be able to see that, it's probably just off shot. If I can wheel it around, there. It's cracked. Yeah, it feels soft, it feels rubbery, and it was covered in little fragments. So it is going. This is on top, is different. But yeah, that's. I do that, it's just leaving marks in it it's just soft so yeah that's the first one that was going now i have to be careful with the teeth on this one god this mechanism's horrible <laughs> this is just horrible let's just see this central gear just crumbling look at that Evidence of the cheese gear just breaking apart. I don't really want it to do this because I don't want pieces of this everywhere like that. I'd rather it come from one piece. Oh, will be enough. Oh, I think it will. Just enough. Cause it really does feel like cheese. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Got it. So that just goes to show the whole purpose of this. These gears are just like cheese. Just useless. And that's why we could see those little flecks of white. It was little shards just breaking off the teeth. But yeah, that's just had it. So, we'll get that cleaned up, the other one off as well, that one probably wouldn't take much to break either, no, nope, look at that, it just crumble. So, we'll get them out of the way, clean it up, get the new ones on. That one, that middle one, feels completely different. I think that's a different plastic. So that, I'm not going to mess with it too much. But that feels alright. I'm not going to put it back on. I'm going to keep it, but definitely completely different plastic. Okay, I've gone around and just cleaned around this with some isopropyl alcohol on a cotton bud and let it dry. Get the old grease out, so I'm going to put a little bit 
of this silicon grease just with a cocktail stick just around the posts this one as well so these are pretty good this one in first This was the one that was drying me the wall. Yes, look like at that. Let's push it down. Let's see, it clicks. Push that one back down, that clicks. That feels good to me. Make sure. The spring is back where it should go. The medium one went there. Yes. Let's push that one down, just wanted to check. And then that one meshes with the one next to it. Again, it should just click into place. I think we've got it in fetching pink. <laughs> Better than cheese. So now what I want to do is get this belt off. Which is going to involve flipping the mechanism over. And more silliness. Uh, I've got to remove the motor. Um, to get the new one on at least. Um, because it actually goes through uh, a little post there, and it's just sorry, it's just out of shot. This is really difficult to film because I can't separate anything on this thing. It's just it's all flopping around. I'm trying to support things as much as I can. That's better. You can see in the top there, the belt actually goes between one of the little posts on the motor bracket. So there's nothing you can do except remove it. Uh, luckily it's only on three screws, but and it'd have to be three slotted screws, wouldn't they? So it looks like there's a screw and a washer that press down on the rubber uh, isolators for. for motor vibration and it looks like that washer has got a metal insert in the middle okay but either way that yes that means I've only got to loosen two and remove one to get the belt out so I'm going to just wash my hands actually no I'm not I'm going to clean and reinstall the capstan and flywheel first that capstan was quite crusty, um, the oxide that was on there was well on there and alcohol alone wasn't shifting it so I ended up using a little bit of, um, you can tell from my fingers, a little bit of um, silvo wadding, um, just went like that with it and then cleaned it with alcohol after. Um, you have to be careful not to pull the bearing up, the bearing's obviously got the oil uh, underneath it, it's interesting that the entire bearing comes out. Um, and the assembly, but yeah, that's looking much better now. So we'll get that back in and uh, get all the gears lined up. There's this gearing on the front of this, uh, and then I'll get the belt sorted. Okay, I think that's in. The back of it has the uh, little bit that holds it, a little tensioner. So I think without the back on, it just sort of flops around. As long as it's engaged. With the pink gear which I can see it moving and it's as far through as it'll go so it is right even though it feels weird it is correct but I think we'll just have to loosely get the belt in place and then when I put the back back on the tensioner will pull it back where it should be which is about there and it will hold it correctly but everything else I think is all right yeah, I can see the um, cam gear actually 
moving ever so slightly so yeah everything's meshed okay. Let's see if we can hold the capstone in place. This new belt. Underneath the motor. There we go. Screw and wash it back in. Tension everything back to where it was. And the capstan's just fallen out. <laughs> and the bearing's just fallen off. All right, the following day, um, my camera card ran out of space, the memory card, but it was just as well because I got pretty late and I think I got to a point where I was ready to review the footage and I actually had to go back and watch um, some of the footage I'd already got to um, look at how some of this went together. So what I don't like about this mechanism is I've got to get this fiddly back part back on to really know that it's going to work properly and I've just got to kind of make sure, as far as I can tell, all these little things like these little springs and the gears and everything are all meshing properly and the cam and everything is all in the right position and yeah I've tried to um, look at the old footage as I say and see that everything's right. I got the belt on last night, again that's not so easy with the flywheel kind of flopping around um, but it is what it is. At least it's on there, the screws are back in the um, motor bracket. So I think uh, I need to try and get this back on and get it the right way around. So I think we do the top first. I've also cleaned, there's a piece at the top here that's loose at the minute. The um, front of that's where the buttons go through. There's quite a bit of muck and fluff in that, that a lot of that I've cleaned out. Um, so we need to mesh this with uh, this big cam gear here at the, the back and that big gear at the back of this um, as that turns it lifts and lowers you can see it moving there uh, that mechanism there which I think is what actually uh, lifts and lowers the head block so there's a little gap there where the um, teeth in this back of this flywheel were normally freewheel but when you press yeah when you press one of the buttons it'll probably be the stop or play button if you press one of the transport buttons it will cause that to rotate and then it will do I'm not sure of the direction I think it's got to be that way I think either way I think it works but it will do a rotation and it will lift you can see that lifting the uh, it'll lift that part up so we need to make sure that's back in its freewheel position get all this wiring out of the way especially that little fine one What's really awkward about this, as I've said, is all the wiring and everything and the rest of the thing is attached to it. So it's not. Certainly not the easiest thing to work on. I'm just looking through, it's hard to see on camera, but I'm just looking through, just turning the motor pulley with my finger I can see another gear moving that it's meshed with so I think we're okay there um, I think I need to clean some more of this because there's more muck visible now on the top and then there's a screw isn't there and a spring there's a spring that has to go in there which is off the pause key uh, I think is it pause it might not be pause it might be eject key actually and then we have to get them on in the right order and again I had to 
look back on the video to um, to see it's not helping that it was quite a while ago <laughs> that I did this because I had to wait for those parts. Let me get my alcohol and frankly this mechanism is enough to drive you to alcohol but that's not the kind I'm reaching for. Give this a clean. And what I probably should do is power up the motor and work out which buttons are which and just check that it works. So we need the power supply 9 volts. Alright, I put power to this and it pushed the head block, not the head block, something at the back up and down a couple of times before uh, it seemed to sort of settle down. Now the motor's running. Uh, fast forward that must be rewind obviously it's um, auto stops working that's a bit rattly that must be play so it just stop that's eject I think oh maybe that's oh no no that's pause Rewind. One thing I'm noticing immediately is that um, if I press, I think that one's play. No, that's stop. That one's play. I'll try and get this in shot. Is I was noticing on the early footage the belt. You could see how it was worn because it was flapping every time you change mode. I'm now not noticing that. So it seems to work, it's a little noisy. I probably should have put a little bit of grease on the gears themselves, I'm not sure. It's unusual to want to do that on plastic gears. Um, but it might be alright if I put a tape on it and put a load on it. Um, I think I'm going to try that with a fast forward. Yeah, it seems to work fine. Leave a little bit of tape there though, but it's going. Alright, the slotted screw is back in there where it goes. So the last thing I have to remember to do is there's a little spring that we took out of here. There's a black peg that's there. I can see this being a nightmare as well. <laughs> and I need my pick to do this I think so there's a black spring and that should go back over that little clear peg oh, oh, oh I've got it that's it that's the uh, eject isn't it yep so that little eject spring is back in the slot of screws back in I think that's everything yeah if I'd have gone in again I did try and get this open again but it's, it's such it feels horrible to open it because you're just cracking plastic open <laughs> um, I might just try and get a little bit through the opening I did actually manage to get a little bit of grease through some of the openings and I feel like it's running in a little bit more now. Um, it's all working actually quite well, I haven't cleaned the heads or pinch roller or anything really yet but um, I'm just sort of, it's a bit hard to work out which is which but I'm sort of getting used to uh, what's what without the buttons on the front. Of course they're not in this order, they're in a, a shuffled order so, but you get what I mean. Um, that spring there is trying to come off a little bit. But 
it all feels like it's working quite well. As I mentioned earlier, I'd noticed that this belt was kind of kicking um, when the modes were changed before because the belt was kind of stiff and stretched a little bit. And if you haven't got good tension, consistent tension on that belt, it's going to cause problems with the, the mode, the servo mechanism basically as they call it, um, because it needs more tension to push the mechanism around so that's where it's going to come unstuck. So having a slack belt on these or a dried out belt really doesn't help them because um, it's got so much duty to have to do. But it all seems quite happy now. In play it's certainly very quiet, seems fine. Even for stop, that's actually <laughs> actually an action that's driven by the motor. And there's loads of torque, especially on the winding, so I've no worries there. Um, pause is working well. Interesting how actually activating it again is a, an action of that cam, but deactivating it is not. It's just an instant release, which is cool because you get no delay. If you're queuing it up to record the latest song from the latest charts, then you want it to be right off the button, and it is, so that's cool. Um, yeah, it's just a bit miserable to work on because it's just such sort of well, but maybe not that fragile, but it's just a bit nerve-wracking to work on because every plastic part you feel like you're going to shear something off. Um, I didn't really have any problem meshing everything back together. I thought that was going to be hell, to be honest. And uh, I can see the auto stock thing wiggling through a little hole there. That's working okay. I'm sure if I hold that, yeah, the auto stops working. So, and it's definitely working on rewind because it immediately stops. Check fast forward. Yep, fast forward as well, so all the auto stops go in. Bags of tension, as I say, on wind and on play. Um, so, not concerned about that, that seems fine. All right, I've been fighting with the mechanism tonight. Um, just to point out, of course all the keys are back on. These have all been polished with um, Plastex and a cotton bud after being ultrasonic cleaned. Um, there was a lot of sort of corrosion on the top, of a kind of green gunk. The um, ultrasonic cleaner shifted quite a bit of that and then just the, um, the plastic has got a lot of the oxide off the what's probably aluminium deposit, um, the chrome plating. And um, I made a, a, a massive mistake when I was trying to get this back together of uh, in these channels that the keys ride in underneath, uh, I put some silicon grease and it just made them sluggish, it made them bind up and crucially problem that it came in for, which was this record key sticking, it made that even worse. If the record key gets kind of stuck halfway, the um, mechanism will just get stuck. If I try and simulate it by putting the power on here, and if that's sort of stuck halfway, you see it just gets like that. See it's now stuck in, which is kind of the way it was in the first place and that needs to release in order for this to come up properly like it's just done there. And this was binding terribly, not only the um, the track for the button, the top piece, but also the, the bit underneath um, was binding as well. The spring behind it is just not very strong. I think if I could have got to that I would have stretched that spring out a bit, made it a bit stronger. Um, so I kind of ended up cleaning it all out again and then just trying a little bit of machine oil. Um, it's just sort of part of the problem here of Philips trying to reinvent the wheel by coming up with this mechanism. It's all very clever, but um, yeah, they reinvented the wheel and didn't need to, and now we've got like plastic on plastic that uh, is just not aging very well. Um, I don't recommend it, <laughs> this mechanism really. There is an order to getting the keys on. You have to do the bottom two first. It doesn't matter which way around, but you do your record and stop keys first. And then you put on uh, the 
rewind, fast forward, uh, is that right? Yeah, rewind, fast forward, play keys in that order, and then you can do the eject key and the pause key um, in any order. Because the way they're offset, that's the order you have to fit them. Uh, again, that was a bit of a fight, and I tried to film myself doing that and just kept getting it wrong over and over and over again. It would have made for a pointless piece of footage. So, uh, yeah, that's all been uh, put back together. That's as good as it's going to be, I think. Um, sometimes it does still get stuck in, but just a tiny bit. But it's kind of a case of if you just bop it on the top, it should come free. It's not ideal. Um, but there's not really much more I can do really, it's, it's just because this is all plastic um, any kind of lubricant to put on there it seems not to like so um, I've just put a little bit of machine oil in there I'm going to leave it upright, it is better when it's upright the way it should be I can leave it like that overnight and uh, come back to it in the morning but uh, yeah, that's I think from a mechanism point of view good to go I think we'll get that back in and then finish off the rest of it. I'm really happy with those gears though, they've been fantastic. It's one of those times again where I'm a little bit tight for repair time, but I'm trying to get a bit more time on the Phillips again. Um, next thing I want to do, and this is almost accidentally because I managed to get this board uh, out by flipping the whole thing on its side. Uh, it was only really the tension of the wires that was holding it in place. Um, I'm going to take some of this um, K-Lube uh, conductive plastic stuff for the faders. I'm going to do all the faders with it while I've got them in this position. Um, then I want to be able to get the transport um, properly fixed back into the front of the case. Um, before that I'll probably just clean the, the apertures around the buttons. Um, and when I've got everything back in, I've got the wires soldered in when I get to that. Um, I think the um, last things to do really will be general cleaning of the case, which I've already done a little bit. I've removed the handle, cleaned that separately. Um, I'll show some of that later on when uh, I get to the, the casing work. But for now, yeah, I'm just going to um, do these faders while I've got access to them uh, and then go from there. Uh, the great outdoors. Quick interlude, I'm cooking dinner, it's blowing a gale outside and I'm full of a cold and chest infection at the moment so not a lot of progress has been doing on this Philips but I just want to cover something because this was driving me up the wall with the potential of it not working. I've removed this horrible clear piece from the front of the tape door. Um, there was loads of crap stuck underneath it and I looked in the useless service manual that just shows it plonked on like that but if you look very closely from the back of it there are little retaining clips and it's basically impossible to get any kind of motion to release those clips and what I basically had to do with this in place was push it from the back until it starts to bend and it really feels like it's going to break. Everything on this feels like it's going to break because it's entirely plastic. It's an incredibly frustrating machine to work on. But I managed to bend it eventually. In fact, I even had one of these little plectrum things stuffed in down the bottom of it and it's already started to chew it up. It doesn't matter. But um, I've been trying this on and off, believe it or not, for days to try and get this um, this clear piece off because I want to clean and polish the silk because if I'd left that on there it would have just looked awful. I've not seen anyone else remove that piece but if you put your fingers behind and just push on it until it starts to uh, bend in the middle um, it should give way. If you try it and you break yours I'm sorry I can't help you. Um, it's what I had to do for this 
and it worked. There's a lot of scuffs and scratches and muck on it, so yeah, I want to wash it and polish it. It's a bit faded as well, it's a little bit foggy, but again, cleaning up is going to help. It's just going to make it look so much better than it did. Um, a lot of the controls as well have been through the ultrasonic cleaner recently, and um, I've also got a new erase head coming for this. Uh, when that arrives, I will show you the old and new and explain why. Hopefully, they'll be the final steps and then I'll be able to properly assemble this and uh, finish off the speaker and uh, do all the alignment and everything even though I think it will be okay and then it's good to go not perfect but better than it was I've actually flipped it round there is some scratching on the top which was over this at the bottom because it matches what's on this side um, but I think putting it this way around you can see that servo tape transport slogan there just to boast so um, I think it looks better that way around um, yeah I'm pleased I finally managed to sort that out so this is a little bit unexpected I've unscrewed the uh, erase head here because uh, I'm hoping this will come across on camera you may be able to tell that the three pole pieces in the top of the erase head they don't quite sit flush with the top curve of the, the head there and there's a, a sort of residue around them uh, that's a glue residue and um, I thought that was a bit odd and I went looking this up and apparently it's a very common fault on these Philips machines what it is is that the uh, three pole pieces the way it's designed are the coil that wraps around the, the central pole piece um, they're glued in but the um, back of the head is not sort of resin filled or anything like that on these but it's a design that they started using in the late 70s I believe and the glue actually fails the glue starts to um, liquefy in a way and the pole pieces can either just drop out or kind of come out of place and if that's left like that even if we were to say oh we're never going to record with it, it doesn't matter well it does because as the tape rides over that it will be riding over an uneven surface and uh, it's likely to leave uh, creases in the tape some people have uh, removed them completely cleaned them up and kind of realigned them but I'm not confident that I will get a perfectly aligned uh, kind of level with that so what some other people do is just say sod it and buy another eraser. head um, so I ordered one which took forever to come for no apparent reason and it came from Wales but um, I've ordered an eraser. head I found one with uh, the same sort of three pole geometry the flanges on it are a little bit thinner uh, than the ones on the original so I'm going to try if need be some little plastic washers but just to note the way this is wired that the white wire goes to the right and the little tiny screen wire goes to the left so I'm going to swap this erase head with a new one which has a perfectly flush uh, pole piece in it and the back of it is actually properly filled uh, with resin whereas on the original Philips ones this will become more clear when I unsolder it the, the back is just wide open and they're really just glued uh, at the very top and they all fail it's a really uh, well documented fault so I'm glad I spotted that so I'm going to pop the iron on just for another look now it's been removed the middle pole piece is actually just sort of pushing out it's not even staying aligned properly and if we look at the bottom you see there's a tiny little bit of resin on the pins there that will hold the coil in but um, not a whole lot so yeah as I say some people take them out uh, and kind of realign everything but I'm not going to bother I've got this new one where the, uh, the top head of that is uh, the top of that is all fully aligned and there's much more resin in the back of that so I'm going to pop this one on that's the new one in, just checked it with a little inspection mirror and it all looks parallel to me the mounting on these should be fairly standard I'll double check it with a scrap tape just to make sure the 
alignment's okay when the head block comes up, but uh, that should do it. You see the plastic pulley right down the middle of the shot there? That's the uh, tape counter pulley, and the belt goes around that and then goes around the uh, I think it's the supply shaft uh, on the tape mechanism. In order to um, fit that belt you need um, a metric ton of profanity. It's an absolute nightmare. I've had this board out about three times now and the difficulties with this are twofold. Um, the, all the wiring, all this mess here, You've got to try and tuck down the sides, and as soon as you try and loosen any of this, it all just pops out like a box of springs. And uh, also, the sliders for the EQ volume and, and what have you, um, you don't actually fix the front buttons directly to the uh, actual slider pots. There's a little sort of plastic coupling that rides in the front panel and you have to make sure that um, when you try and put all this back together they all align and they all kind of fit back in so I just pull all the sliders right down um, but it's quite easy to bolt all this board on and find that one of the sliders isn't coupled to the actual pot and if you get any of this wiring overlapping on this lip at the edge you'll trap it when you put the case on so I've had to go back to the earlier footage multiple times to try and suss out uh, why on earth you know a piece of wiring or something is sticking up where it was originally and it was all really sort of pushed underneath because it can't as I say hang over this the edge of this lip because the case won't go on properly otherwise um, and obviously I don't want to keep screwing this in and unscrewing it again multiple times because it's going to upset the plastic threads um, and I don't want to be taking this out I did it all completely forgot to do the counter belt so let's take it all out for a second time fight with that counter belt you've got to try and hold the tape deck and get underneath one side through this silly eject thing and then out the back and I've had all sorts of hooks and tools and pliers and all sorts of trying to get all of it and do it even try a piece of tape at one point to hold the belt on and it wouldn't have it and then you get things like this where there we go something just refuses to go until eventually it does um, but it's the Dolby button or something that's catching it is I've taken that off several times as well it's easier to do without. So there is a little index pin here that you uh, put the board through and you push it down and then hold it down and just try and make sure you can do it by feel. All the sliders are properly engaged. If they're not engaged with the pot, they feel really loose. So you can usually, usually tell. And if you're careful, sometimes you can shine a torch through and the torch is out of reach. Great. I'm just gonna have to wing it, I think. Please don't get the impression, by the way, that this is a consistent, uh, straight through process that I've done there's been huge breaks in this project because I've had several things going on throughout January uh, that have caused my priorities to shift a little bit so um, this has taken a long time or has been spread across a lot of time let's turn our attention to these speakers for a bit then so one has been done it's all been cleaned and as mentioned earlier the back-to-back -back treatment's been done on the uh, grill this one I'm going to take apart, I'm going to clean up, I'm going to do exactly the same thing. So there are uh, I think just two screws in these and they're quite far down so you need a screwdriver with quite a decent shank on it and 
I've never noticed before actually, this is quite amusing. It's got a uh, pat test sticker on the back of it. <laughs> Yeah, there's just two screws. When you take those out, the bottom half of it will just hinge up and then the whole thing will come apart. There we go. And the speaker is just held in, or the base speaker should I say, is just held in with a spring on the back. It's just a kind of spring that holds the pressure against it uh, it's pretty dusty and yet they have uh, white cones or a kind of off-white color so um, my initial thoughts about doing a dye job on these like I did on that Hitachi um, <laughs> were put to rest when I opened them was surprised to see that they are uh, yeah they're white cones um, so yeah you can get the uh, main kind of cover off from the woofer um, I think all you have to do is finagle some little clips and what makes this a bit difficult is the uh, wiring on the little piezo tweeter there um, just kind of gets in the way so um, what we can do is just pull it off I'm just going to break the connections on that red goes to the center I'm going to resolder it afterwards that makes it much easier to work on you can now wash this front piece and uh, oh there's a little bit of plastic coming out of something there and then yeah these little clips if we can get by these the woofers they just push out and you can remove the front like that this one it is possible to remove it you have to sort of bend clips in this way and it's a bit of a faff i don't think it's really that necessary um i was able just to clean around it and then do the back to black job with the cotton board without having to take this one off you can if you want to it wasn't really a bother for me so there's a lot of muck around the bottom there's a lot of muck around that so everything's going to get washed and this is just going to get a basic clean out on the back the uh the back cabinet but this is going to get a proper wash so this is where we do the back to black stuff and fortunately in my case my can i think is a little bit expired and the um, spray nozzle on it's a little bit gummed up and because of that it tends to sort of pool around the top of the can which is really handy just for getting a cotton bud in and just soaking it up and um, doing this you do have to go over this quite a bit to try and get it to soak the stuff up but you'll start to see the colour really starts to uh, come back to what it's supposed to be and if you look on the back of the grill there you can kind of see the match so it's a slow process but I think it's better than having to paint it Can you see the edges, the difference there, definitely got to be pretty liberal with it, it really drinks it up. This is the first time I've actually got power into this uh, from its own um, power supply at least, not directly running the motor off my bench supply. First thing I noticed was that if I have this on uh, tape, there's a horrible uh, kind of rushing noise sound on one channel and a very, very weak signal. The other channel's fine. I'm kind of messing around with the mono stereo spatial control um, here and then the balance control. It's kind of all over the place, it's weird. What I know is definitely working. All the pots are fine, um, nothing scratching or anything. The Dolby is working. The tape preamp seems to stay permanently on, um, no matter uh, whether it's playing the tape or not. But when the transport is actually turning over, you can hear it muting, so it must not one of the leaf switches to mute 
while it changes mode, uh, I suppose while the motor's turning on and off. Also, if I touch the casing of the motor when it's on uh, tape, um, it makes a horrible buzzing sound as well, so it's like there's a, maybe a bad ground or something going on somewhere. Uh, I'm going to have to investigate, but let me just find my screwdriver and because uh, I've taken the switches off here uh, flip this to tape and you'll see what I mean it's doing it on headphones as well as speaker so if I put the switch to tape <laughs> it's making that awful noise and yeah it kind of it's kind of indescribably affected by these. Now the EQ is definitely working so everything's functional there and if um, I do play a tape uh, out of one channel it is working fine. Um, I just tried um, isolating this by, I've only got one speaker plugged in, by um, moving the speaker to the other channel and um, I've uncovered a crime let me show you. Yeah, I went to pull the plug out of the socket and the little boots come off the back of the wire there straight away. And it's clear that someone's ripped this off before and done a horrible bodge job to uh, try and fix it back on. That's just like hanging uh, just by threads and it's almost shorting out as well. So that's going to have to be put right. That looks terrible. I'll have to check the other one as well. I've just spotted the problem. See that little head wire there, it's not attached. I was wary of this um, when I was working on the transport and everything and all this was flopping around a couple of times it did keep tugging on these wires that are just soldered to the bottom of the board and I had a feeling that eventually one of them was going to give way the others look alright we'll have to work out where it connects but yeah you can see there's a little red wire there that's not actually attached sorted it and it works. Just been testing some tapes through this and um, it felt fractionally slow. I checked it with the speed calibration tape on the meter and it was averaging very very close to what it should have been. Uh, I was getting about average of about 2.9, 2.95 um, kilohertz on the 3 kilohertz tape uh, with occasional peaks just at 3k. So I did just bring it up a fraction. I think it was within spec, but it just, I, I can just tell when something sounds ever so slightly down. Um, so I did just um, tweak it with the pot in the back of the motor. And it's difficult because those pots, because they never really get touched, they're not very smooth. They tend to be a bit jumpy. Um, but I managed to get it uh, just to average on about uh, 3.05, I think it was. And um, it just sounds and feels better now comparing this recording with digital recordings. Uh, it just feels like a better fit. The alignment and everything sounds great. I don't think I've got to touch it, which is good because you've got to take this clear piece off the front and try and get a, a Torx headed screw um, into the, uh, a Torx headed screwdriver rather, with quite a, a long bit on it uh, into the uh, screw to be able to adjust the alignment. <laughs> it made that really awkward. Um, so I'm glad I've not got to touch that. It sounds fine with the tapes I've tried it on the alignment and the response sound okay um, it definitely does that thing that a lot of boom boxes at the time do where it boosts the bass when the volume's lower so as you bring the volume up you get more mid-range um, it kind of compensates for uh, less bass respon response in the standard speakers as well but uh, yeah so I'm going to uh, finish cleaning this up and um, get it back together I've just put the screws back in the cabinet and just a word of warning, if you ever try to put one of these back together and you're having trouble getting the casing to go back together on the, uh, on the cassette side, be aware that um, these two sockets, I think it's the mic sockets, this board tends to wiggle sideways a little bit and I was fighting with this quite a bit to, uh, to get it to, to go back together and thought it was a wire or something in the side that was caught but it wasn't. Took me a while to realise it was these little, these little sockets, see these three and a half mil sockets that were kind of pushed sideways a bit because the board was pushing sideways and they weren't fitting into these holes. I just had to put a little screwdriver in and just kind of get them to stay in place while I pushed the case back on and it went back on fine. 
If you ever put in together a stereo and you get any kind of resistance when you put putting it together, don't force it, stop. Uh, and have a good check over because if you've trapped any wiring in the side or any interlocking lugs or anything in the plastic, it's really easy to cause a load of damage. I've had stuff back from repair shops where the case is all mangled up because um, little lugs and things in the case and all little bits that protrude or whatever have not been um, done with care because they were rushing. So slow down if you ever get that problem. Second thing to be aware of if you're ever cleaning a painted finish like this one, because this one was not in great shape, there are some scratches on it, there are some paint splashes that I've got out. There was some adhesive residue of some kind and if I look in a certain light I can see a mark here where something must have been stuck to it, like a piece of paper or something, but here there was kind of, it didn't immediately look like adhesive residue but it definitely was on top and it looks better than it was, it's never going to be perfect. But bear in mind, you know, all of that is expired paint. That's um, all oxidised paint and that's come off with um, the bumper restorer that I use. But again, be careful with painted surfaces because it, it could be so easy to rub straight through that and back to the plastic. Um, but yeah, I'm going to finish the rest of this. As I say, it's got marks and things on it. It's not perfect, but it's a lot better from a distance than it was and it feels a lot better and that's always really important to me. I mentioned in other videos the kind of tactile sensation of something being properly cleaned um, is really satisfying as they should be. Uh, they should be to use. That's to me is the whole point of getting them ready for the experience of being used again not just shelf ornaments. Bear with me a little bit. I'm a little bit croaky today but it's all back together. Uh, I waited for the sun to come back out to get the, the closing shots of it and the final cleaning so I could see it properly. Um, yeah it looks great with the speakers finally matching at last. It's not perfect, it has got some scrapes and marks around it but much much more presentable than uh, when it came in. Uh, it's going to last much longer now that those gears have been done. It is a bit of a controversial design from uh, the engineering point of view really with the, all the plastics in there. I can sympathise with Philips at the time for feeling the competition from the Far East definitely um, in what uh, could be manufactured for what cost and um, it was a pretty bold move to try and use their best engineering skills at the time to mould just about everything out of plastic and to try and make a cassette mechanism that they could use across quite a wide variety of um, appliances that they made whether it was big sort of boombox stereos like this or double decks or even small portable shoebox recorders that plastic mechanism was used or a variant of it was used across a lot of stuff and even stuff like some of the CD players I believe used those same gears uh, and that same kind of thing um, as we've seen it didn't really stand the test of time uh, it makes them very difficult to work on uh, very frustrating to work on and it doesn't make them age very well because plastic um, is known when used in sort of certain structural things to um, shrink or warp or change uh, when you've got things like the buttons that kind of have a part that binds against another part when it would have been better as a, um, a steel or brass part uh, when it makes a kind of axle or something like that yeah you can tell the difference uh, I know the sun's coming out now, everything's getting really bright and overexposed, good old natural daylight, ever reliable. <laughs> but um, yeah, I'm just going to do a quick sound demo of this. I fixed that uh, bad soldering job on the speaker and just put a little bit of glue on the plug um, to stop it coming off again. Um, the other plug's fine, I noticed the one that I fixed had got a bit of tape around it, so that was a telltale sign that someone's been in it. The other one's not been touched. Um, so yeah, someone had tried to tape it closed after after uh, doing that mess of a soldering job but uh, yes let's get a sound demo of this and close this video out